A uh, delight and pleasure to be back here with Professor Daniel Matt, who is a teacher of Jewish spirituality and one of the le world's leading authorities on Kabbalah and the Zohar, written many amazing books you should be sure to check out, such as The Essential Kabbalah, uh, God and the Big Bang, and of course, translated the Zohar, which is just a massive achievement. So thanks for taking this time to talk. Thank you. Good to be with you. So I want to think together about the, the mystical meaning of Torah. And just to start, as, as uh, folks know, there's many levels to the interpretation of, of Torah. And I wonder, how does the Zohar relate to Pshat, and Pshat meaning the simple read of the text, and what's beyond Pshat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the Zohar, it's, it's very important to, to accept the Pshat of, of the Torah, but for the Zohar, that's really the starting point. Or you could almost say the springboard. Mm. It begins with the pshat and then looks for a deeper meaning. It's not satisfied with the pshat, mm. but it's not going to reject the pshat. It just thinks uh, that the, the, the deeper you go, the more you discover. Mm. So, the, But the Torah is the Torah. Like, What could be beyond? What could be beyond Torah? Well, there's an amazing teaching. We've talked about this briefly. Amazing teaching in, in the Midrash that says, Torah is an unripe fruit of wisdom. Now, it's very strange. You would imagine the rabbis would say Torah is the full flowering mm -hmm. of wisdom, the full yeah. expression of wisdom. But there was one rabbi who, who, who seemed to think that wisdom is beyond the Torah. The Torah, mm -hmm. you might say, is one reading mm -hmm. of divine wisdom. And if the Torah is somehow unripe, then the question is really, well, how do we ripen it? Mm -hmm. And I think the way to ripen Torah is through interpretation. Yeah. That's what every tradition does to keep its teachings alive. Mm -hmm. So the text has to be massaged, the text has to be penetrated, the text has to be imagined. Take the famous example, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The Torah seems to imply literally, if I gouge out your eye, my eye should be gouged out. The rabbis could not believe that God wanted that type of uh, vindictive justice. Mm -hmm. So the rabbis said, well, what it really means is monetary compensation. You always have to be careful when someone says it really means. Mm -hmm. It really means, probably means it doesn't really mean this, but we're going to take it in a new direction. So the rabbis were willing to introduce new, different meanings of Torah, and even they were willing to establish the halakha based on that new interpretation and not the simple shot. Hmm. So how do you think we prepare ourselves for the interpretive process today? Like, what is our job as readers of, mm. of sacred texts? in terms of what we bring of ourselves and of our worldview mm -hmm. uh, uh, to these texts? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we have to be um, simultaneously conservative and innovative. Mm. So I think we have to learn the, the thousands of years of tradition mm. of how that verse or how that chapter in the Bible was interpreted, but then to allow our imagination to work too. Mm. There's a beautiful teaching in the Kabbalah that the Torah is written without vowels, as we all know. When you open a Torah scroll, there, there aren't vowels there. And this Kabbalah says the reason they're not vowels is so you can read the word in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there is a correct yeah. way to read the Torah. And if, when it's read publicly, there are people up there who will correct the reader if he makes a mistake. But here, the Kabbalist wants to leave open the possibility for a new meaning. Yeah. So, uh, jumping off that, w what's an example of the Zohar's radical conservatism? And what's an example of the Zohar's radical innovation? Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the radical conservatism, where it's taking the verse absolutely according to its simple meaning, is the famous ritual of Yom Kippur, the scapegoat, mm. the goat that's offered to Azazel. Yeah. So according to Leviticus chapter 16, one goat is offered to God and one goat is offered to Azazel. And that is actually the name of a demon, a desert demon. Mm. Now, you won't find many rabbis who will say openly that on Yom Kippur we all give an offering to the demonic. Mm. But that seems to be what the Torah is implying, and the Zohar takes it at its word yeah. and develops a whole theory of why you have to assuage the demonic forces. So that's accepting the pshat, the yeah. simple meaning. Mm. A radical rereading, maybe the most radical, is how the Zohar reads the opening words of the Torah, mm. Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. But the Hebrew actually says, in the beginning created God. Now obviously God is the subject. Mm. That's like in English we would say, thus spoke the king. Mm. In the beginning created God. It means God created. The Zohar says, no, let's read it exactly how it's written. In the beginning it created 
God. So who is the it? The it is the God beyond God, mm. the ultimate divinity, mm. Ein Sof. And that brought into being what we think of as God. Mm. What we think of as God is not the true ultimate reality of God. Is the Zohar still committed to a radical monotheism or is there more multiplicity there? It's a monotheism, but the Zohar would say from our perspective, God appears in multiple ways because mm -hmm. of our limitation. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, God is one, but we can't grasp the oneness, so we, yeah. we identify male or female mm -hmm. judgment or love. Yeah. So many think of mysticism as actually something limiting and more narrow. It's a traditionalism, it's an essentialism, it has to do with... Uh, <clears throat> The, the tribes of who's in and out and gender and all of these uh, more restricting factors. I wonder, all of that may be true, but uh, to what extent might Jewish mysticism offer a more expansive worldview, sort of a more expansive mm -hmm. Jewish experience rather than a more constricting one? Right. Yeah, it's strange. Some of the mystics really become fundamentalists yeah. and some of them become radical yeah. innovators and both tendencies are, are, are there in the Zohar. I think I think the mystical search is vital, but also somewhat dangerous. Mm. Because once you open up the boundaries, who knows how far you'll go. Yeah. And a person might feel, I don't need the rabbi, I don't need the tradition, mm -hmm. I have my own path mm -hmm. to God. Yeah. So the Kabbalists are trying really to, to walk a tightrope. You know, emphasizing personal spiritual experience, mm -hmm. but feeling that one, one is part of a rich tradition mm -hmm. and one should never stop exploring that. Yeah, great. All right, so my last question for you is moral dangers when it comes to interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the dangers that one might uh, uh, come to if they're committed to sort of a radical shot? You know, just reading and accepting texts on a surface level. Right. And what are some of the moral dangers one might come to by uh, only in sort of embracing a mystical approach or going too far that direction? Right. Yeah, yeah well, let's start with the fundamentalists. Yeah. There, there's really a narrowness and there's a, a tendency to think we have it all or we have a monopoly on truth. And I think we should be open to the wisdom in other traditions as well, not limit ourselves just to the, the gift we've been given. And then the mystical path also has its dangers if you start to question your own identity and your, your normal sense of self, which the mystic does, if you try to find a, a link between yourself and God, you can, you can easily step you know, too far and claim that anything you want to do is your own right, yeah. that God is speaking to you personally, right. that God right. is working through you. Yes. So I think it's important to keep some common sense mm -hmm. and to, yeah. to have a chaver, mm -hmm. to have a, a friend, a, a fellow searcher who will who will remind you that uh, we're all mortal. Amazing. Thank you so much. Be sure to check out Professor Matt's uh, uh, works, and we'll have more podcasts up later today.